Good morning, and uh, welcome to the International Law Association British Branches Spring Conference 2014, um, and a true welcome. And my job as president of the branch, Jeremy Carver, is to welcome you and to express appreciation to our hosts for this conference. We have now, it's been, Alan will probably tell me, because he was secretary at the time, I think Daniel Bethlehem was the first to inaugurate a new spring conference of two days, and it was probably about 25 years ago. Um, they have been almost universally successful since then, and this conference stands every chance of being similarly successful. A huge debt is owed by the British branch to the Dixon Poon School of Law, its new principal, who I belatedly must acknowledge because he's been already in office in a year and I haven't formally congratulated him. So my profound congratulations both to David Caron for being appointed and to the Dixon Poon for having the wisdom to appoint him. Uh, can I also express thanks to Brianna Allen who has, as far as I can tell, maybe not single-handedly, but played an enormous part, at least from my visibility, in organizing this conference, uh, which I know you're going to enjoy. And I now happily hand over to David. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Good, good morning, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to King's College, London, Dixon Poon School of Law and this meeting of the British branch of the ILA. So uh, I am very thankful to this year's organizing committee. And yes, Brioni did it uh, virtually single-handed. But I, I'd like to mention uh, a few other people who are here today uh, and recognize them. Dr. Thomas Schultz, Professor Guillermo Verarame, uh, Dr. Philippa Webb, uh, Palin Eckham, and Nicholas Vulgaris. So thank you all for your efforts on making this meeting happen. Um, we are, uh, my wife and I are approaching the anniversary of our first year here at London and in London and at King's and we're delighted and to host this meeting of the British branch is a very uh, significant, wonderful way to end that first year. The law school itself is in the east wing of Somerset House, which is directly due west across the quadrangle. I'm sure if you want to visit, uh, have a look at the home, uh, a number of faculty would be happy to take you around. The theme of our meeting this year is Foundations and Futures, and it's intended to capture a very real sense in which we are pulled as an academic field. We, on the one hand, have, over the coming two days, panels addressing very foundational traditional subjects as the relationship between legal orders, custom, and sovereignty, while on the other hand, there are panels addressing technological futures and armed conflict or human rights in the digital world. The terrain is both familiar and yet also oddly transformed. And thus the idea of foundations and futures is intended to reflect the challenges we all face. Our keynote speaker this morning is someone deeply associated with foundations uh, and the future of international law. James Crawford is the Weywell Professor of International Law at the University of Cambridge and a fellow in law at Jesus College, Cambridge. James has contributed to virtually all aspects of international law to highlight any part is to overlook the range and diversity of his work and with that risk all too clearly in mind, uh, let me focus on two particular strands uh, that are particularly meaningful to me. James' work on the creation of states, now in its second edition, as well as his masterful stewardship of the ILC articles on state responsibility. Two efforts that place his name uh, indelibly on these key foundational stones. And the great range of his scholarly work over the past decade has been complemented by a dazzling presence uh, in practice before the International Court of Justice, as we know, but also before it lost the WTO, the Ethiopian Eritrean Claims Commission, and in exit proceedings, to name a few. As my term of presidency of the American Society of International Law came to an end in 2012, 
I had the pleasure to see James receive the Hudson Medal of that society. I thank him for joining us today. James will be speaking on the identification and development of custom. Uh, he intends to speak roughly 40 minutes. We'll have time for questions. Um, please join me in welcoming James to the podium. Start with a quotation from the Latin author Ennius. Moribus antiquis res stat Romana, which I'm sure you will have immediately translated as the Roman state survives by its ancient customs. The question is whether the, sta the state of international law survives by ancient customs or indeed customs at all. And I'm asked to talk on the identification and development of customary international law against that background. Among the foundations of international law, customary international law may be considered the bedrock. It's the foundation on which other foundations are built. Despite being riddled with paradoxes and contradictions, we're still trying to solve some of the basic problems about custom, but perhaps they'll be solved during this meeting. It has a a relatively systematic character. It underpins the institutions of international law, which go beyond treaties to the, the states themselves, institutions, as well as the practices of diplomacy, treaty making, and so on. We see it in motion as states and other international actors engage in dialogue over time. I'm going to address both the identification and the development of custom. I begin with a point of language. The word custom derives ultimately from the Latin consuetudo, the verb contuescere, which, mean, which means grows accustomed to or to be used to. Custom is a habitual act, something that's repeatedly done over time. And the magic ingredient in the formula is time. Custom requires time to develop, even if that is short. One cannot logically describe a habitual practice as a custom if it's arisen instantaneously. Uh, it's like cu coffee, it has to be brewed. That creates a very serious problem, because what happens on the first occasion that something is done? Uh, on one view, it can't be custom. If it can't be custom on the first occasion, how can it become custom on the second occasion? The matter was highlighted in an exchange during the recent arbitration between Mauritius and the United Kingdom, when the issue was when the customary international law of self-determination developed. It mattered in that case because the Chagos Archipelago, assuming for the sake of argument, and I, with Alan Boyle here I say it only for the sake of argument, that the tribunal has any jurisdiction over these matters. The question was whether the excision of the Chagos Archipelago, which was, in quotes, agreed to by Mauritius at a meeting in 1965, prior to its independence in 1968, violated the principle of customary international law, or alleged principle of customary international law, reflected in article in paragraph 6 of the Colonial Declaration of 1960. And that involved the question, article 6 deals with the territorial integrity of self-determination units. And the question was whether Article 6 reflected customary international law in 1965 or 1968. The United Kingdom said that it didn't come into existence until at the earliest 1970, which gave it very little time before the International Court in 1971 said that it was customary international law, the last possible moment, you might think. I was counsel for Mauritius, as you would already have gathered. Um, but there was a problem because, as, as Judge Greenwood pointed out in a question to counsel for Mauritius, if the rule only, uh, was only identified in 1968 as customary international law, that meant that the excision which occurred in 1965 was lawful. 
And customary international law applies, is subject to the rule against retrospectivity. Therefore, the conduct was lawful even though the rule had changed, and even though the United Kingdom was criticised for the excision by the General Assembly in 1968, by reference to paragraph 6 of the Colonial Declaration. The flaw in the reasoning, I, I, the flaw in the question, I wouldn't, of course, suggest that Judge, Judge Greenwood's questions are anything else but perfect. But nonetheless, the flaw in the question was the assumption that customary international law can never be applied for the first time. If customary international law can never be applied for the first time, it follows it can never be applied for the second time or at all. And that produces a system which is so rigid as to be cataleptic. In fact, the problem is you don't know what customary international law is until the occasion arises for its application. So time has a, a very curious element uh, in that it tests the existence of something which you cannot know exists at the time that the event occurs. What matters is the reaction to it. Otherwise, we have, to take a, a simpler example, perhaps the Truman Proclamation. Otherwise, the Truman Proclamation was unlawful at the time that it was made in 1945, the first occasion. And if it was unlawful, how can it have given rise to rights, in particular rights of the United States? It's the reaction to the Truman Proclamation that makes custom, and it makes custom in a certain sense retrospectively. The same is, of course, true of the common law, uh, which uh, develops through the decisions of courts, which by definition refer to events which won't have had the same status as common law at the time they occur or may not have had. So custom is a judgment of acceptability over time, but a judgment that relates back in terms of the acceptability of the acts which test its existence. And that creates a series of paradoxes and so on which I tried to explore in my Hague lectures last year called uh, The Course of International Law um, and concerned with both order and change in the international legal system. On the 16th of December 1920, the statute of the Permanent Court was adopted and it empowered the Permanent Court to apply international custom as evidence of a general practice accepted as law. So there are two elements there, and the two elements have survived criticism, including by the ILA committee, which suggested that the element of acceptance as law was at least secondary, if not uh, on certain, certain circumstances unnecessary. Acceptance of law is often referred to as the subjective element. And the definition in Article 38, Paragraph 2 was purposefully pliable. During the proceedings of the advisory committee in 1920, in which the provision was drafted. The view was expressed that it was the court's duty to develop law, to ripen customs, to crystallise them into, po into positive rules. But how can crystals ripen? It seems a contradiction, or at least a, a, an internal contradiction. You can understand fruit ripening or crystals forming, but crystals ripening? I'll return to this question in due course. The same definition of customary international law was adopted in Article 38.1b of the statute without further consideration on the ground that uh, the formula was by now hallowed. An international custom of it as a general practice accepted as law. Now that formulation is defective because it puts the elements of customary international law in the wrong order. Evidence is not a constitutive element of customary international law. It's adduced to prove its existence. And since the question whether something is a rule of customary international law is a matter of law and not fact, the notion of proof itself is problematic. It's notable that the term evidence was not to be found in the initial proposal for Article 38, Paragraph 2, considered by the Advisory Committee. And more recently, the International Law Commission, which under Sir Michael Wood as Special Rapporteur, is looking at customary international law started out with a formula which included the word evidence, but then took it out, and has now changed the subject to the identification of customary international law. 
a quite proper decision, though it was made on the ground that the word evidence couldn't be translated into French. <laughs> it's rather surprising that the French legal system operates without reference to evidence. <laughs> In fact, the, 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 the article, people have tended to make a fetish of Article 38, which was no, nothing more than a modest aim to define the applicable law for the permanent court, now the international court. Article 38, paragraph 2, does not identify any formal law ascertainment mechanisms because these are not based, identified on the basis of formal criteria. But the interconnection between identification and evidence in the sense of material from which something can be derived of customary international law does not mean that if the ascertainment of, of the rule is a non-formal process, the evidence cannot be formal in a given case. In fact, as Sir Michael Wood points out in his second report on customary international law, which is being published later this month, but which I'm grateful for him, to him for providing a, an advanced copy, um, the written materials which form part of the judgment of what customary international law is are in principle more or less unlimited. Anything that pertains to the question, that pertains to the judgment that has to be made, uh, is relevant. And customary international law is not a question of the determination of a point of fact. It's a judgment made by someone, and it, c it can be almost anyone. It's the normative status of a given proposition. That's why customary international law can be found in the judgments of courts, because the judgments of courts are authoritative judgments as to the existence of particular norms. Whereas if custom was a matter of evidence, in the strict sense, the decisions of courts, though they might contribute to international law in other ways, could hardly be described as custom. The courts make decisions which inevitably involve novelty and can't be referred, simply referred back to the status quo ante. I'll focus for a moment on treaty law and customary international law. Treaties can be ascertained in a simple way, in principle, by virtue of the instrument in which they're contained. One can tell precisely when a treaty comes into force, in principle, whereas customary international law is not ascertained by reference to such criteria. And yet the two sources of law are intimately entangled. One might describe custom in the modern period as what is necessary to fill gaps between treaties, to help to determine the meaning of treaties, and to elaborate the effect of treaties in relation in particular to non-parties. Indeed, there's a tendency to say when you have a treaty which is widely adopted and comes to represent the law on a particular point that the treaty, in effect, confirmed what was there before. That shows you the impact of customary international law as a somewhat backward-looking source. It looks back to the beginning of the process by which it is ascertained and determined. So the court considered that there was an inherent customary right of, right of self-defence in Nicaragua, merely confirmed by Article 51, and the notion of inherency certainly supported that proposition. But treaties may, it's very difficult to avoid using the word crystallise, emerging rules. They may be constitutive of custom in a way which uh, is difficult to explain if you just look at the uh, law of treaties itself. This was the case, obviously, with Articles 1 to 3 of the Geneva Convention on the Continental Shelf, though the material on the basis of which those, those provisions were concluded was already firmly supportive of the idea that they were custom in, ad in addition. Let's turn to the relationship between customary international law and the International Court of Justice. While the court identifies rules of customary international law in the process of settling disputes, its judgment constituted what, what, what might I describe as the best indication, I hesitate to use the word best evidence, 
of what international law is. And the court has a, a sort of canonical effect in the establishment of rules, even rules which have very little uh, rationalization associated with them in the court's judgment. I should say, to be fair, that the court has improved in recent times in the level of rationalisation that it is providing for the rules that it articulates. An outstanding example is the decision of the court on immunity in, in Germany, Italy, which is extremely thoroughly reasoned. Though, to be fair, it was easier to do because the materials on state immunity are very well known and very, uh, very accessible. So the decisions of the courts as to norms are in practice treated as authoritative pronouncements of the current state of international law. The customary status of the rules which the court articulates is thereafter t tends to be unquestioned, even though the court is, does not engage in state practice in the narrow sense. In his work on the identification of customary international law, Sir Michael Wood has firmly, and I think the Commission itself already, has firmly endorsed the two uh, element theory of custom, practice, and so called opinio juris. Though it's a pleasure to see that they've abandoned the word opinio juris, instead using the phrase acceptance as, which is um, at least has the advantage of being English. Um, there has to be general recognition, although the international law has never provided a precise number of states required to support a particular rule, but other than by reference to general phrases which tend to beg the question such as virtual uniformity. The real problem in relation to generality is how to distinguish mere abstention from protest by a number of states, silence or inaction as the Commission calls it. This was a problem in the Lotus case where the inaction of states in relation to the prosecution of persons for crimes on board foreign ships on the high seas uh, was one of the key arguments put forward by France for the proposition in that case. In, in collision cases. You can say that the court misjudged the consequences of this general abstention because the rule was subsequently, the, the ruling in the Lotus was subsequently reversed in the 1958 and 1982 conventions. But an alternative view is that the court actually was proceeding on a meta principle in relation to the exercise of jurisdiction based on some uh, available ground a meta principle, that, in effect, a presumption against exclusive jurisdiction, which the international system then reversed in that specific context. Which interpretation of Lotus is correct has a significant effect in terms of other areas of the law of jurisdiction. I turn to the second element, acceptance as law. While some consider this element as re redundant, it is in fact essential. Custom derives its normative force from the acceptance of states and of other relevant actors. That a particular proposition is binding, that is, it is required in the circumstance. This element is necessary to distinguish customary international law from mere usages. There are many international acts which are performed almost invariably for example, in the fields of uh, diplomatic protocol, which are motivated by considerations of courtesy, convenience, or tradition, and not out of any sense of legal duty, as the court said in the continental shelf cases. The subjective element has historically been expressed in Latin as opinio juris sive necessitatis. The phrase literally means opinion of law or otherwise of necessity which doesn't make much sense in English. In fact, I'm reliably told it doesn't make much sense in Latin either. The phrase is an interloper of recent origin. It was unknown in Roman and civil law, unlike the dual elements of custom. It's a concept of late 19th century German provenance, 
introduced as part of the positivist theory of international lawmaking. It was, uh, otherwise, what it was what was necessary in order to fill the gap led by, left by the abandonment of natural law theory. Without consent, there could be no basis for obligation. Express consent was for treaties and tacit consent for customs. And hence, the opinio juris idea was introduced for the first time, it seems, in 1896 by Alphonse Rivier, who suggested that custom operated through the repetition of facts with the consciousness of their necessity. And then in 1898, the magic term itself was used by Franz von Liszt, who actually used the uh, Latin phrase. It was picked up by the permanent court early in its existence. It was this positive wave that the court surfed in the Lotus case. It required states to show, more or less to prove, that a general practice apparently consistent with the putative customary rule was based on their being conscious of having a duty. States are not normally conscious creatures. They're abstractions. And the consciousness of states is a very awkward idea. Um, the term opinio juris was first used by the court in the North Sea Continental Shelf case and then spuriously taken up in the Nicaragua case, where the, fr the court used the phrase opinio juris sive necessitatis in terms. I say spuriously because the question there was what was the applicable law in the absence of the multilateral treaty, which was the applicable law. The court made a mistake between jurisdiction and applicable law in order to assert jurisdiction under the Charter in relation to the conduct of the United States, notwithstanding the Vandenberg Amendment. So it's not a particularly auspicious occasion for the announcement for the formal um, consolidation of the phrase opinio juris. But in fact, individual acceptance or non-acceptance by particular states is neither necessary nor sufficient. The court infers the existence of opinio juris in more, in more cases than not from multiplicity of sources, or indeed from inference from the nature of things. I refer, for example, to the recent decision on provisional measures in the case brought by Timor-Leste against Australia in, re in relation to the detention of certain documents, where the court inferred from more or less from first principles the putative existence of the law of legal professional privilege at the international level, with next to no practice to support it and very few decisions. So the court in its creative mode can develop custom on the basis of uh, very little by way of material sources that provided it seems it thinks that the need is required, that the need is demonstrated. The court, in other words, is not systematic in its approach to identifying customary international law, especially with regard to the element of acceptance as custom. It often affirms that a particular rule is declaratory without detailed analysis. It looks to resolutions. For example, in Nicaragua, it referred to the Jet Friendly Relations Declaration. In substitution for the Charter, despite the fact that the Friendly Relations Declaration was an interpretation of the Charter, uh, a, a nice example of ignoring um, the act what, what the language of the text actually says. In Nicaragua and Colombia, the court simply asserted that the definition of the continental shelf beyond 200 miles laid down in Article 76.1 of the Law of the Sea Convention was customary international law. Not because there was a huge amount of practice supporting that proposition, the practice is incipient, but simply because there were, there were no other alternatives on offer and the parties themselves were not prepared to offer them. In Gabshkov and Ajumarosh, the court adopted the rather controversial conception of necessity as a defence as a circumstance precluding wrongfulness, in large part because both parties accepted it in principle, though they disagreed as to its application in that case. So the strictness of the court's approach to acceptance as law depends on whether the state of the law is the primary point of contention between the parties, or whether the parties accept it and, and wish to proceed with questions of its application. 
On the other hand, the court has a critical mode, and I've been dealing with the court in its, uh, shall we say, open mode to new rules of custom. In other circumstances, the court can set against custom and require, or indeed even ignore, a very large body of practice in reaching its conclusion. The classic example of that are the, is the court's approach in the field of diplomatic protection to the rules formulated in bilateral investment treaties and, and, and prior to that in friendship, commerce and navigation treaties, which there are thousands. You might think that thousands of treaties in more or less the same terms provide a significant indications of state practice especially when numbers of those treaties refer back to international law in various ways. But the court was inclined to say that the existence of the treaties show that they're not customary international law. Otherwise, why would you have treaties? A remarkable proposition for a court which is supposed to consist of people with diplomatic experience. So, the answer is that, or the conclusion to this is that although the two phase or the two stage or two, two part component of cust components of custom are generally accepted, the way they're applied depends on judgments made by the applier, whoever that may be. And they depend on factors which are not to be found as part of the law of evidence, but are our judgments made by more or less experienced persons as to the needs of the legal system at the particular time. It's often said that that is a subjective and uncertain process, and so it is. But it's the process that occurs, and it leads to the situation where, as a result of the accretion of custom over, of practice over time, rules come to be accepted even though they were uncertain at the beginning. We can say for sure that the law of state immunity is what it has come to be through that process even though the components may not be particularly um, persuasive or well-reasoned or articulated. It's been said that the court statute is, and I quote, a convenient instrument to, to vindicate the progressive development of international law and its expansion. This is apparently what Baron de Caen had in mind when he originally proposed Article 38.2. Customary international law was, according to him, a very natural and extremely reliable method of development, since it results entirely from the constant expression of the legal convi convictions and the needs of nations in their mutual intercourse. That's the end of the quotation. So customary international law is, is often used in relation to the development of rules which the international system needs, where treaties have not filled the gap or have not filled the gap so far as the parties are concerned. For example, in, the outer, in relation to the definition of the continental shelf beyond 200 miles. In that, in that, in that way, the, the customary international law has major advantages from a, an adjudicator's point of view over treaties. Treaties require to be ratified. They may not be ratified by key players. They require to be articulated by often laborious processes. Whereas customary international law can be declared to exist in the twinkling of an eye. We've seen that process at, say, at, at, at work in spades with the acceptance of very large parts of the IOC's articles on state responsibility as custom, despite the fact that if those articles were submitted to a diplomatic conference, they would, in my judgment, be torn apart. And it would take another 40 years to put them back together again. Uh, for example, Article 16 on complicity has been declared by the court to be customary international law in the Bosnia case. Despite the fact that when it was first formulated by Roberto Argo, it was explicitly formulated as development. There are some bits of the, of the articles which I thought were development in 2001, which I'm now convinced are customary international law. The process of acceptance has occurred in the absence of diplomatic proce procedures other than endlessly repeated debates in the General Assembly Sixth Committee on what to do about the articles. There have now been five of them. <coughs> 
though each has been worse than the previous one. Indeed, there seem to be two stages in the development of customary international law, a point made uh, originally by Philip Allard and uh, at a later occasion by John Finnis. The first occasion is the assertion by an actor of a particular rule. The actor can be almost anyone, but is most commonly a state. The second is an acceptance, not by that actor, but by others, of that assertion. So the process of acceptance is a, is a dual process. It's a process of articulation by the entity which seeks to rely on a rule in a given case, or more generally, followed up by a process, a diffuse process of acceptance by others that the rule is as articulated. The fact that this happens so often, even at a time when most international law is made by treaties, demonstrates the continuing need for customary international law. So the theory is that an international court or tribunal seeking to establish a rule has to engage in a widespread, thoroughgoing review of the materials. That does sometimes happen. But when it happens, it's more likely than not that the tribunal is going to reject the asserted rule of custom. It's when the, it's when the, the court says it's quite obvious that a rule is a rule of custom, that it hasn't engaged in that process and it's more likely to endorse the rule of custom. Another paradox. Now you may be worried by now that if international law in its foundations is as insecure as I've suggested, that we've got a problem. If we, if we haven't solved, the, for example, the Baxter paradox of how to turn multilateral treaties into custom 50 years after Baxter first formulated it, if we haven't solved the self-referential character of customary international law, uh, Customary international law is what I say it is because I am expressing the opinion of jurists that I happen to have. Then we, we may be thought to be engaged in an activity which is meta, metaphysically radically insecure. I don't want you all to leave or to think that from now on you will engage in taxation or intellectual property. <laughs> because the the customary international law is, in its ultimate, an expression of our need to have rules in relation to given situations which go beyond the positive law of treaties. And that's a need which has always been felt and which is still felt and which we only imperfectly articulate. There are many of our needs which we only imperfectly articulate and which we nonetheless still need. It's been suggested that what it was intended to be a blessing, the flexibility of customary international law has turned into a curse, because almost anyone can assert almost any proposition of customary international law as custom. Uh, to quote Daspremont, the intellectual prison of custom seems to be gradually transformed into a large dance floor, where almost every step and movement is allowed or at least tolerated. I have to say, that's a dance floor that I'm familiar with because I can't dance. <laughs> and he suggests that this diminishes the authority of customary international law as a source of international law. That's why he calls for a rejuvenation of formalism in the ascertainment of international legal rules, one which involves the abandonment of the fallacious trappings of customary international law. I have to say that although in many respects myself a formalist, I was uh, one of his teachers after all, I think that customary international law is inevitably escapes the, the strictures of formalism and inevitably involves judgments of appropriateness over time by the interpreter of the, given situ of the particular situation. Indeed, the most important surviving manifestation of customary international law, which used to be the way in which most human affairs were, uh, were elaborated, is, is still the field of customary international law, precisely because the, of the absence of a general legislator. Customary international law still encapsulates the changing practices and attitudes of states. Its flexibility is a difficulty, 
but as Sir Michael Wood points out in his second report, much of the hand-wringing and agonising about the, the subjective elements of customary international law ignore the fact that at a certain level it works. The, con the content of customary international law is the product of what can only be described as a dialectical process of international actors relating to each other over time and identifying the institutions which may underlie their own existence and their own capacity to speak. It's necessarily identified by reference to non-formal criteria. What led Ennius to state in 239 BC that the Roman state survived by its ancient customs might lead one to state in 2014 that the existence and the endurance of the international legal system is still owed to the practice-based practice system of customary international law. Thank you very much. James indicated he's willing to uh, entertain questions. Um, Morris. James, should I call for you? Morris. Yes. yes, Morris Mendes. doing something. 
The problem is that there are cases where there is simply no evidence in that sense. I, I fully accept that there are situations in which you can go back, uh, for example, in certain fields of diplomatic practice and show that something is regularly done. But if you look back to the history of diplomatic practice, it wasn't as regularly done before it was articulated. For example, we, we accept now a general principle of the immunity of diplomats from taxation. If you go back to the early 50s and look at Sandstrom's attempt to find authority for a general proposition of immunity from taxation, for example, in relation to local rates, it almost didn't exist. So I have to say that the process of developing custom international law is like the appetite that comes from eating, if I can use an Italian phrase, which I won't attempt to say in Italian. It's like the process of working out whether something is necessary by being faced with the necessity. And bootstraps. Sorry? I said bootstraps. <laughs> well, bootstraps, got, uh, bootstraps are an example, but uh, states levitate anyway, so they might as well levitate in relation to custom. I mean, the, the state is not on the ground, it's in our heads. And much of what passes for custom is the elaboration of the way we think about particular problems when we're faced with them. Um, there are situations in which that is evidence in the ordinary sense. But as I've said, there are n numbers of examples where the court looks at what is a large body of material and fails to find that it's evidence of custom in the sense of drawing the conclusion that that is custom international law. Diallo is a recent example of that. Um, in Timor-Leste, the court conjured, and I'm, I'm not really critical of them, uh, conjure the principle of legal professional privilege more or less out of thin air. Um, and yet we probably need a principle of legal professional privilege. And it matters, I think, that Australia, in response, didn't deny that there was some principle of legal professional privilege. Its proposition was the more subtle one that if you're going to generate a principle of legal professional privilege from the necessity of states being advised in confidence as to their legal rights for the purposes of litigation and other uh, similar purposes. You should at least look to see what exceptions domestic legal systems apply to legal professional privilege because you may, you may need such exceptions in public international law as well. So I, I think the difference between us is probably one of emphasis rather than uh, principle. But I would emphasize the extent to which uh, it's not, uh, and there, are two, there are two different processes. All, de all determinations of custom international law involve evaluation or appraisal or assessment in principle, no matter who does it. How much authority they have depends on who does it and how well they do it. And that's another judgment which is made as a sort of third judgment, you might say. So I add to finish as two stages a third, and perhaps at the end of this conference we'll have a fourth. Professor Tissouz. Thanks. John Tissouz, UCL. Um, that was a brilliant lecture, James, and I just want to see if I can push you a bit further away from your formalist strictures. So one thing that you said I think was very important. You characterized what we would normally call opinio juris in terms of acceptance and judgment. What's crucial about that, these are cognitive notions. You're making a judgment that something is the case. This is very different from a traditional understanding of opinio as an act of will expressing consent. Now, I happen to agree that primarily opinio juris is a judgment, and I just wonder whether that is something you're openly embracing, that what's fundamental in opinio juris is making some sort of judgment about law or about what's morally required to be law. That's the first point. The second question is you talked about the need to make these judgments in light of, or the need to factor in the needs of the legal system in determining how the two elements of custom play out. Now, someone might say, unless there is a, there's an objective truth and some kind of genuine reasoning we can engage in about what the needs of the legal system really are, 
unless that's the case, then we may as well pack up and go home or just recognize this is just a purely political arena. So are you willing then to sign up to the thought there are objective truths about what these needs are? Which one, you can edge me onto the gangplank, but you can't let me jump in the sea. Um, I accept that the determination of custom is an evaluative process and it involves an appraisal. And it's not simply an assertion of weighing of evidence. A weighing of, e of evidence in the sense of material sources is part of the process because the evidence is indications as to the needs of the community. Um, and I say that uh, in a slight modification of the text of the eighth edition of Brownlee, where custom is defined. I, I, I don't have the text in mind precisely to mind, but it, as, as a, a judgment by a person as to, the, as to the, a given norm. And who the person is depends on the context. Um, as to whether that judgment reflects reality, well, it might or it might not. Um, some people believe there is a, an underlying normative reality. Others don't. I'm agnostic on that point, and I remain agnostic because it seems to me we need to make progress from one stage to the next, whether we're concerned with the excision of Mauritius or the independence of Palestine, or whatever it might be. This is the only way we have of doing it. It may be formed by uh, metaphysics in a certain sense. It may be that it's flowered under the influence of thinking about religion much of the debate about sovereignty goes back to the debates about the sovereignty of God. Uh, some of us feel that we might no longer believe in God, but nonetheless we still have to do these things. Others might draw from the fact that we do them in a certain way, more uh, ex uh, certain existential truths. Uh, I, I, don't hate, I, hasten, I hesitate to say that's a question of taste. But I don't think one has to be committed to a particular religious position to hold to the validity of what we're doing. I think there are some conclusions that you can reach as the existence of custom, which are reasonable and justified, even if that which we cannot say without the greatest impiety, there is no God or he has no care for us. End of quotation. Professor Foot. Mary Footer, um, University of Nottingham School of Law. Um, thank you, James, for a very uh, inspiring talk this morning. I want to push you a little bit on acceptance as law, because you mentioned uh, in two different contexts uh, acceptance of law first by the International Court of Justice, that this could be done by states and other relevant actors. Later, you talked about a more general two-step process for customary international law formation where you have acceptance by another actor. Could you please elaborate upon what you mean by other actors, assumingly, uh, I assume, other than states, and does it matter in which forum the acceptance is taking place? Thank you. The international system does draw a distinction between the persons who perform acts, uh, create norms, um, and so on, in a, in a formal way. States, international organizations, and certain other entities are assimilated to one or other of the above, and everyone else. Because it's in, an informal system, uh, it's not the case that the individuals and non-governmental organizations can't impact on the process, they can. But they're not regarded and I think rightly not regarded as having the sort of legitimacy which states and the entities they've accepted as actors on their plane have. Uh, of course, the idea of the international plane is an, is an imaginary idea. There's no such thing as the international plane, even though there are frequent flyer points. The international plane is not a place, it's a way of thinking. But it is the way we think. And it's remarkable how international relations scholars who are prototypically skeptical of the existence of international law, in every sentence they utter, they're talking about legal institutions because they're 
primary focus is the state, which is a legal institution. The state doesn't exist except that we think of it. So, and a last question, Professor Boyle. Sorry. James, I'll, um, I'll stay away from self-determination. We'll do that <laughs> here about that later. But I, can I just tease, tease out of you, I think, one point. I, I, I spent most of my life telling students, just because it should be law doesn't mean it is law. Yeah. But um, that's almost, it seems to me, probably where you've got to in the Timor Leste case, and a bit like the arrest warrant case. Functional necessity, it ought to be law, the system needs it, let's make it up. Now, it seems to me what's lacking there is the process. The ILC can make up international law. You've, in, in other places, I think very well articulated why they need to do that. But there's a process of interaction within the Commission and with states as a multilateral process. States can make up law, they can negotiate the Law of the Sea Convention or whatever. That's, in effect, almost negotiating custom. But functional necessity in the ICJ, arrest warrant, Timor-Leste, the ICJ making it up because it should be law, I, I just think that's, that's going too far, I think, for me, because it's not a multilateral process, it's a bilateral or, or maybe trilateral process. Um, sh you know, should we be happy that the ICJ sometimes invents the law, or, or should we be worried? I find as time goes on, I become happier with the idea. <laughs> the problem is there is no choice when you're confronted with a, a claim to a privilege which has never been made before in legal proceedings. You, you, you're basically confronted with a choice, uh, admittedly between the parties, but nonetheless a choice to recognise it or not to recognise it. And if the legal materials don't provide much guidance as in this area, they certainly don't. You have no alternative but to make a decision. Um, now, I fully accept that the decision is not the last word. The thing we have to accept about custom is there is never a last word. There is no last word. There are simply judgments which we are justified in making at a, at a given time or which we think we're justified in making which others may endorse or not. Um, I'll give you an, a recent example which was the subject of debate in the Croatia-Serbia case and the Genocide Convention. In the Bosnia case, the court adopted, uh, admittedly, as an interpretation of the Genocide Convention, but it's widely accepted that that reflects the custom international law of genocide. A, a rather strict formulation of what, what uh, was involved in the specific intent for genocide. But they then went on to say, as an adjectival matter, that unless the evidence was such that there was no other explanation for the conduct but the existence of the genocidal intent, then genocide had not been committed. And that adjectival proposition, which was as part of the judgment and, the, and the, in common law terms, the ratio of the Bosnia case, is problematic. And it was the subject of debate between the parties in the case. We'll see what the court makes of it. Now, that's not a customary process in the sense of local yokels on the village green. Um, but we're much more sophisticated than that. We, we, we can't a priori exclude the argumentative processes of courts and tribunals from the way in which we make up the rules by which we regulate a very disorderly decentralized system. And so the element of necessitatis, of necessity in the formula, is very important. We could go on for quite a while with questions. Please join me in thanking uh, Professor Crawford for this one. So our program calls for a coffee break directly across the hallway as you go out. There's a room with coffee um, and some snacks. Look forward to seeing you in the parallel sessions at 11.15. Thank you.